Hello! Well, it's been a while <laughs> since my last video. Um, not for lack of trying, actually. I've got loads of stuff that we've filmed. Um, although the main progress on both the Land Rover project and the Organ Stroke Zill project have been massively impeded by the dreadful weather that we've had all winter. It just, as anyone in this country will know, it's just been endless, endless rain. Um, both projects are at the point most of the work is outside, so yeah, that's been that's been difficult. Lots of people in it have written in over the last month or so, just inquiring after me, um, which is really lovely of them, and thank you all for that. And so I just thought I'd make a, a little video to say yes, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm pretty much in isolation as as we all are at the moment. Um, I am filming some stuff, and I've decided to make a quite a few more films. But what really prompted this video that I'm making now was a comment that's appeared on under one of my videos somewhere. I can't quite remember the exact comment, but it was something along the lines of I bet you're glad for your self-sufficiency now, Max. And I've been thinking about that a lot all this week. And that's what I wanted to talk about, really, because I'm not. I'm not glad of it at all, really. Um, I'll put this in context. This whole thing with the coronavirus, this whole global pandemic that we're facing is something that I've been personally worried about since I was about seven. I mean, I was a very strange child, admittedly, but I, I, at the age of seven or so, you know, that's when I built my first um, nuclear shelter in the garden in case of war. I mean, this was a cold war. It was, it was not entirely unreasonable. Um, Although I followed the government guidelines at the time and I'd built a shelter that wouldn't have survived, you know, a, a stiff breeze, really. Um, anyway, <laughs> the point is that despite being a fairly self-sufficient lifestyle and despite having, you know, lots of skills that you would think would be useful in, in times of global strife, it's not enough. It's not enough, i found, you know, in the last week or so, I've been worrying a lot ever since this the coronavirus really came to public attention I, and and it became apparent that it was targeting vulnerable and, and older people much more than youngsters. I was worrying about my granddad who's very old, you know, he's, he's in his 90s and and you often think he's going to go on forever but you know he's he is old. And then over this week I started thinking Crikey, my parents, my parents are old now, they're at risk, and then I started thinking about everyone else, and that's when I decided that, yeah, self-sufficiency, it's, it's not enough, because it's not enough that I've learned these things, it's not enough that I live a off-grid you know, off lifestyle, and it's, it's not enough that I'm personally prepared for disasters. It's not enough that I'm okay myself, because I'm not that bothered about me. I'm more bothered about the people that I care about. And unless, and it turns out I care about more people than I thought. And unless they're all okay, I'm not okay. So that's really what I wanted to make this video about. It's about the people that matter to us and this whole thing the movement restrictions that we're under at the moment. So at the time of filming this, there's very strong advice to to narrow down your social contact and that's really difficult. It's so easy to think of yourself as an exception, to think that there's something you have to do, there's someone you have to go and see. And the reality is that you can look around and in your immediate environment there is probably no one ill. So you think, why, you know, it's not affecting us here, you know, we're fine, let's carry on. But that's very much a human response. It's a natural human response, but it's, the, it's just like responding to anecdotal evidence, to something that's happened to you and then extrapolating it to the rest of the world. As rational people, we can look to wider evidence than what we can see with our own eyes and that's what telling us that there's a storm coming you know and it's 
what we do now is very, very important because once it hits, it doesn't matter. I think of the movement restrictions that we're under now as being like bulldozing fire breaks through a forest. If you were to go out in winter and bulldoze fire breaks through a forest, there'd be plenty of people saying what a fool you were. You know, there was no chance of fires coming through. You're ruining the trees, blah, blah, blah. It, it, and, and yet, when the fires are raging, it's too late to go and bulldoze those fire lanes. It's all about being ready beforehand because you can't be ready during. You can't prepare for something when it's actually going on. When the emergency is happening, that's when your preparedness pays off. And this is our time for preparedness, is to try and delay, to try and just to slow down. So one of the videos that I've been working on, one of the projects I've been working on, which I've been filming, is making a rose arch. And I've been promising my mum a rose arch for more years than I, <laughs> than I want to remember. And I think round about Christmas time I said, to, right, I'm going to do it, I'm actually going to make it. I mean, what prompted this was the fact she let on to me in a, when she was visiting there one time that she actually bought a rose arch from Argos, for, I think for about £20, and I was obviously quite ashamed <laughs> to hear that. So I said, right, I'm going to start work straight away. I'm going to actually, you know, get on with it now. So I've been making that, and of course it turned out to be lots more effort than I thought it would be. It's a very simple structure to look at, but it turns out to be quite an effort to make. Anyway, I was trying to make that for her birthday in January, and didn't make it. But I thought it's fine. Don't, don't beat yourself up over it. I thought I'll be there for Mother's Day. I'll deliver that, and of course Mother's Day is tomorrow and I'm not going to deliver it. So I was thinking about my parents this week and you know I, I, I rang my mum which is such a rare occurrence that it turns out her landline has some kind of security system on it to stop spam callers and it was you know assured me that as soon as I'd said who I was it would put me through to that person and I said who I was and this automated voice says, I'm sorry, I can't connect you right now, and hung up on me. So that was <laughs> strange. So I had to text her and get her to call me back. Of course, by that point, she probably thinks that something is, you know, terribly wrong. But I had to say to her, the, the best thing I can do at the moment is to stay away. I mean, how terrible is that? My dad had emailed me a while ago saying he wanted to come and visit here. You know, this was before all the latest restrictions. And I phoned him up yesterday and, you know, I had to say that, yeah, he couldn't come here for the foreseeable future. I couldn't go there. And that's, that's difficult. And it's, you know, the very best thing I can do for my granddad, who's, you know, very old and you know, I dearly love to go and visit or to have him come visit here. The best thing I can do for him is to, to, to not go anywhere near him, just like everybody else. So this is, this is why, and this is just the start of it, I, then I started thinking about all the other people and that's when I realised it's, it's not enough that I'm prepared, you know, I've, I've spent a big chunk of my life just learning the things that I wanted to learn in order to be practical, a practical person, and setting up my life so I wouldn't worry about electricity cuts and I wouldn't worry about utility bills and I wouldn't have to depend on outside things. But I am a member of society. And this recent thing has really st struck me that I think it's not enough that I'm all right by myself because that's irrelevant. We all live in a world and unless that world is ticking along to a greater or lesser extent, what's the point? You know, what's the point of hunkering down in a bunker while the world burns outside? It's too late by that point, there's going to be nothing to go back to. We need to fix it before it burns. You know, these are the things that have been brought home to me. 
but also the despite all the things that I've learned and my own personal preparedness there's there's nothing I can do to help the people that I care about the, the people that are old are vulnerable and the people that are frail are vulnerable and I can't help that there's, I'm utterly powerless to do anything about that except for maintaining the distance from everybody that I can and I had a long discussion with a friend of mine last night on the phone a really long discussion because all, all you know all I wanted to do was go and visit them they've been through a really hard time recently and I wanted to go and show my support and visit and I had to say I'm not going to do it I want to, I really want to, but I'm going to choose not to. I'm going to choose not to travel, not to see them. And that's, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of tough. And it's tough because it doesn't seem urgent at the moment. It doesn't seem, I don't know anyone with coronavirus. There's no one I can see in the village who's got it. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's not here yet, but that's the point. That's why the movement restrictions matter. It's because what we're trying to do is to, to delay that storm that's coming. You know, when a hurricane hits or something like that, you're on someone else's timetable, it's going to hit. You've got the time you've got to prepare. This is slightly different in that by spreading ourselves out, by isolating ourselves, by being absolutely paranoid about washing our hands and so on and so forth we can slow the impact of it and that's going to be critical for those old and vulnerable people it's going to be critical because when they get ill and lots of them will get ill they're going to need treatment and they're going to need beds to go to and if everybody is forced into hospital at once it's going to be the same situation that we've been seeing recently with the supermarkets with the bare shelves there's plenty of supply line to the supermarkets but panic buying means that the shelves are empty and they're empty regardless of how much you need it if you see what I mean and it's going to be the same with people that really need treatment aren't going to be able to get it because there's not going to be any capacity left in the hospitals if everybody gets ill at the same time I read somewhere this week that the last great economic crunch like the one that we're going to suffer soon being the depression was solved by a huge mobilization of people and this crisis that we're in right now will be alleviated by a huge demobilization of people it's a tough thing especially when you're someone like I am that tries to fix things there's no fixing this apart from not being part of the problem it's just so important that we all try and do that just for a, a short while although it's not going to feel like a short while I mean, 12 weeks I think is very optimistic and that's why they're talking about 12 weeks until the worst of this is over. I suspect it's going to be a lot longer than that. But 12 weeks is going to seem like a long time. But then... That's all we can do. And that's what we must do, I think. to Just to try and slow this down. To give to mean that the cases can come in and out of hospital enough that it's a, a manageable flow and not a deluge all in one hit. So yeah, here I am, you know, the, this is the evening, it's Mother's Day tomorrow and all I want to do is go and see my mum and give her a rose arch, you know, and it, it, <laughs> it's, it's a really simple, it's, it's, it's an utterly trivial thing, I'm aware of that, but I can't do it, and you know, that's a 
that's a real bummer. But it, it's it's only really a symbol of, of you know the, the, of, of what I'm feeling. A couple of days ago, I went to a post office to send off some orders that I'd made for people, and it was really heartening to see there that in the queue at the post office, people were maintaining a decent six foot distance between each other and and even in the supermarket people queuing for the tills there were maintaining a sensible distance. Things were much calmer than they had been in the last week or so which is really good to see and I think we can do it, we can, <laughs> we can all be like grown ups. That's what we're going to have to do. I think that's what, that's what it boils down to, we need to be like grown ups, we need to look at the bigger picture and say yeah holidays aren't going to happen visiting our friends aren't going to happen we need to narrow down our social circle to just the absolute minimum and nobody wants to do that obviously I don't want to do that but it's necessary because in the weeks to come we'll look back and say oh if only we'd put ourselves into isolation a couple of weeks before you know and right now we can look at the example of Italy where they're really suffering where their their cases are well exceeding capacity and they're struggling like it just looks awful that is coming our way it doesn't have to be quite that bad we can alleviate the impact somewhat but yeah it's it's going to be tough. And we're going to lose people and it's it's desperately sad. It's sad for every every life that will be lost that doesn't need to be lost, you know? It's and I'm speaking of someone that's only here because of medical intervention. There's been several times in my life where I've needed to be in hospital. You know, I've been in intensive care before. Um, I was only there because there was room for me. You know, if and I think that's the point I'm trying to get across is that if we can all just maintain some distance, just for a, what is really a short while in the long term. We, we might all just get through it. Back to the channel then and this YouTube thing. I was recently watching YouTube and I was watching a video I think by Alan Thrall is a fitness channel and I think it's probably a video on weight loss or something like that, I'm not entirely sure but anyway the, the, the thing that struck me is he said don't concentrate on what you can't do Think about what you can do and do that and in this recent situation where I'm sat around in isolation or near isolation feeling helpless to, you know I can't do anything about what's coming our way for all my practical knowledge I have no medical skills I was thinking what what can I do and I think there's going to be an awful lot of people at home um, and many of you out there don't have the distractions that I have around me of having a workshop or a garden or a woodland to go and play in. Um, you're going to need something to watch <laughs> on the YouTubes. So I think I'll make, if people are interested, I'll see, I'll test the waters with a video that I was going to make anyway. Um, I'm going to make a series of videos perhaps, or at least one, on things that I think are useful that I happen to know and I think other people might like to know about as well practical things so there'll be a whole raft of them and feel free to suggest others as well I was thinking um, how to change a tire you know that's and I have a yeah I have a reason for that one um, how to light a fire and how to light a fire effectively and how to make it burn effectively you know so slightly more in depth than just your basic how to light a fire which I think I'm pretty sure everyone knows how to do that but we'll 
push it a bit further. So yeah, things like that. I'm working on the projects, I'm working on the Land Rover, I'm working on the Zill. Obviously Mark's not going to be able to come and help me work on the organ part of it for the time being. But there's plenty to do on the truck, there really is, so I'm going to crack on with that. We were really hoping to take it to a festival this summer, but yeah, that's not going to happen. But we can still make the truck roadworthy, so there's going to be some interesting stuff coming up with that, I'm sure. I was really looking forward to finishing my Rose Arch video with the actual delivery of it. Um, because my mum lives on the other side of the country and my plan is to deliver it there on the roof of the Land Rover which is going to be quite an adventure in itself. Yeah. Hopefully one day I'll still get to do that, but uh, yeah, not for now. So that's it really. I just wanted to say to everybody, we can all do our bit. We can support those if you have key workers, if you are a key worker, you're really valued. <laughs> and for the rest of us, if we can't, be a direct part of the solution then we can just avoid being part of the problem and not spread this virus. The longer we can push it back the more not only capacity will be available in hospitals but the more treatments that will come through and eventually there will be a vaccine and we can put this whole thing behind us and start rebuilding the economy. So yeah like I say, self-sufficiency is not the answer. There's a society, you know, and we we need that. As, as human beings, we need some kind of society to live in. I live off grid in the sense that I'm not connected to the national grid. I'm not connected to water utilities. But I have a mobile phone. I have internet, you know. I even pay council tax now. <laughs> I'm part of society and I do believe in society. I believe in the health service, not just for selfish reasons, but for selfish reasons as well. I don't think you can have a society without a, a national health service. It, it just seems f a fundamental thing to me that we take care of the the infirm. That That's that's what civilization is, isn't it? Anyway, stay safe everybody and I'll see you soon. Cheers.